In Proverbs 13 and verse 15, the scripture says, Good sense wins favor, but the way of the treacherous is their ruin. And I don't think you can find a better example of that than uh, Samson. Samson was a figure that uh, serves as an example for us <clears throat> on how to uh, ruin our lives by sin. That sin is a terrible, terrible, terrible part of anyone's life and that we should do everything that we can to avoid letting sin have any part of the life in which we live. People don't like to talk about sin. They don't like, they, they, they've softened it when they do talk about it. Wickedness is called weakness. Uh, sin is a slip. Iniquity is called discretion, mistakes. We don't like to call sin, sin. Samson was a sinner as a result of allowing uh, his heart to run free from him, to, to run after anything and everything except what God called him to be. We need to begin seeing sin as God sees sin and not as the devil advertises it. Sin will ruin us. Sin will destroy us. It's our responsibility to, to look at the high price of sin, and we can see that in the life of Samson. The high cost of sin was that it cost Samson his sight. In chapter, 20, in chapter 16 and verse 21, as, we was, as was read a while ago, the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and brought down brought him down to Gaza and bows, bound him with bronze shackles, and there he ground, the, ground at the mill in the prison. Did you know that the devil still blinds people today? If you would, take, turn in your Bibles in the New Testament to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. The devil will do the same thing, just like in the Garden of Eden when... <clears throat> When he said, you surely shall not die, yes, you will die. In the day that you eat of that, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in the day that you eat of that, then you shall die. And that's exactly what happened to Adam and Eve because of their wickedness. But notice in 2 Corinthians, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of the world has blinded their minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. There comes a time when, when the devil will blind us to the consequence of sin that we will not see the true nature of sin and how that it will ruin us and that how sin will keep us from going to heaven, that sin will ruin us to the nth degree. Some are blinded by Satan today. Some people call good things bad and bad things good. In Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, woe to those who do that who call the good evil and evil good, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, and who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. Sin can blind one to its very nature. Sin sometimes people will think is a good thing. It, it, can, it can ruin us by making us think that what we're doing is righteous and good and, and cause us to think that, that uh, good things that we do are bad. In this country since 1973, we've killed millions and millions and millions of babies in the name of choice. But the babies didn't have any choice. It's sad that, that now it, abortion is nothing more than a contraception, another choice to be made. Do you think that God will not hold us accountable for those lives that are, those innocent lives that are taken day after day, year after year, decade after decade now? God is going to go hold us accountable. Yes, it, it's a terrible thing that, that, that women have gotten themselves in a certain circumstance. But why compound that which is evil 
by making it even worse. Let us remember that sometimes when we think that there's only one choice, that God has given us more than one choice. And the choice to do what is right is always the better choice. It may not be the easier choice, but it is the better choice. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, we find out that the result of all sin is death. The devil clouds our minds into thinking that, well, this one time won't hurt. Well, this one time won't make a difference. This one time won't make any consequence at all in my life. Yes, it will. Every sin that we commit weakens us and draws us closer to the devil and draws us away from God. So that one sin is a diabolical, uh, terrible, awful situation that takes us away from what God would want us to be. The wages of sin is death. The Bible tells us that you and I should worship God in the beauty of holiness. How can we come before God in a life that is clouded in sin and filth, thinking that God will accept us in any old shape, form, or fashion in our lives? We need to change our lives to be more of what he wants us to be. That's what the true nature of conversion is all about, to become what God wants us to be. Sin destroys that in our lives. Sin costs Samson his freedom. Again, in chapter 16, verse 21, Samson was taken down to Gaza, and there he ground grain in the prison. You know, Samson is, is a figure in, in Scripture of true power and strength. We see him being able to destroy Philistines with the jawbone of the ass, with thousands, thousands of those uh, soldiers falling to his, his strength. But it was God's strength that made that happen. But he traded that strength. He traded that strength away from from what he had because of his sin. It's interesting that both Samson and his mother had to have something to do with this Nazarite vow because he was a Nazarite from even before birth. His mother must have loved Samson to devote her life to make sure that he never had a haircut, make sure that he never ate anything that had to do with raisin or a grape or anything like that, that he never drank wine, never drank grape juice, that he stayed away from those things, that he stayed away from anything that was dead. What a sad situation it was when he welcomed himself into harlotry and the devastation that harlotry brought. When he went down to Gaza and then stayed the night with a prostitute, throwing away the hard work that both he and his mother had done through his younger years, throwing those years away, blinded by the consequence that it was going to cost him something. It would cost him his freedom. This strong man who was able to do so many things lost that freedom to roam and to be what he wanted to be. Did you know that sin will enslave us today? It will cost us our freedom. Look in John chapter 8 and verse number 34. John chapter 8 and verse number 34. Listening for pages to turn. (laughs) John chapter 8 and verse 34, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a, what's it say? Slave to sin. In Romans chapter 6, verse 16 through 20, the same thing is, is enumerated. He says, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one of whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you were once slaves to sin. 
have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the natural limitations, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. So now you present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. The opposite was true. When they were slaves to sin, they were slaves to unrighteousness. They were free from doing what was right. Now they are free from doing what is wrong. When we are in Christ, we are free. We don't practice any of those things anymore. Sin can enslave. I wish my friend James was here today. He could tell us just how hard it is to kick a habit that drugs can lead in their life. Praise God, he got the strength, he got the courage, he got the stamina to do that. But he will tell you today he'd wished he'd never done that. How many of us have participated in a sin and found that it had a stronger draw to us than, than anything else in our lives? Many of us are slaves to things that are so horrid and terrible that we don't want to talk about it, but we need to talk about it and we need to get it out of our lives. We need to be careful about sin because sin will blind us. Sin will enslave us. Sin will ensnare us. Many times sin promises freedom. Oh, look at all the fun you can have, but really what it's bringing is death and bondage to that sin. So we must be careful to run free in Christ instead of running free in sin. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. Sin will overtake you and hold on to you longer than you ever wanted to be held. Where you cannot get out. Sin is a terrible thing. But also, in Samson's case, he finds out that being involved in sin now cost him his strength. Look at verse 19. And she lulled him to sleep on her knees, and they called for a man, and he shaved off the seven locks off of his head, and he began to be in torment, and his strength left him. Have you ever realized the moment that you fell from the favor of God? And how terrifying and horrifying that is when you realize, I never thought I would have done that. I never thought I would have said that. I never thought I would have gone there. I never thought I would have done this particular thing. And then realize that you want to do it again and again and again. That's the way sin works. It takes away the strength that you have to combat sin because the very strength which is God. I, I get tired. I get so weary of hearing people say, well, I'll come back to church when I get things straightened out in my life. Brethren, do you not realize the one thing that you need to do to be strong is to be in service to the Lord, to be a part of the kingdom of God. Your strength to overcome is found in Christ, in his people, in the Bible, in doing those things. And when you're doing the things that the Bible tells us to do, when you're living in sin and you're not reading your Bible, you're not attending faithfully, you're just doing whatever you want to do, there, you, won't, you won't ever find strength to get things straightened out. Because the strength is in the will of God and in the word of God and in the assembly of the saints. That's where we need to be. That's where we need to start to start coming back is to be in, fam be in the family of God. 
It breaks my heart when people say that one day I'll get things straightened out. I'm not so sure that we won't be straightened out before the time comes for us to be right. Sin weakens us. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 30 that during the Lord's Supper, taking the Lord's Supper without thinking about how important it is and what it is for us to be gathered around the table, the blood of Christ, the, the, the body of Christ, that if we take that flippantly without any regard to what God wants to be, that it weakens us. Sin weakens one spiritually and often weakens one emotionally. It weakens one physically. Going back to, as an example, to drugs and alcohol. You can see, we, I had a friend who was a sheriff's deputy in uh, Dallas County. And he had pictures of people over a long period of time that uh, had been arrested, and their arrest, their mug shots, I guess is what you call those, that they take when you're issued into or ushered into the, the jail in Dallas. Their pictures were taken over the years, and you could see the ravages of their drug addiction. Beautiful young women, young strong men who lost their teeth, who looked they, like they were 60, 70, 80 years older than they really were. They looked terrible. They were weakened by their sin addiction. Sin is a terrible, terrible thing, and it takes its toll upon us physically, spiritually, emotionally, physically. Every way that you can think of, sin is a bad thing, and we need to stay clear of it. Sin will destroy you. Sin will kill you. Sin will keep you out of heaven. We don't want that for anyone. And then sin cost Samson his self-respect. Look in Judges 16 and verse 25. And when their hearts were merry, they had a big party. And when their hearts were merry, they said, Call Samson that he may entertain us. So they called Samson out of prison. And he entertained them. And they made sport of him standing between the pillars. Sin will rob every person of their visage, of every visage of self-respect and self-esteem. Shame is a tool that God uses to wake us up. When we do something that, is, that we're guilty about, shame, not wanting to admit it, is a tool. When you feel shame about something, that means that you have sinned and you need to turn your life around. It's a good tool as long as we use it for the purpose to drive us back to God, not to drive us away saying, I can't do anything about my sin. Yes, you can. You can come home to God. Samson, this strong, beautiful man with the beautiful hair, is now a laughing stock in front of all of those Philistines. Can you imagine how he felt standing there, blinded, having everyone mock him? Look how strong you were. Now look at where you are. That's exactly what sin does to us. But oftentimes it's ourselves looking ourselves in the mirror saying, look at what you once were. Now look at what you've become. Today is the day to change that. Sin will rob a person of their self-esteem, but it robs them of the pride that God has for us when we fall away from him. And now little children abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have 
confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. You know, when Jesus comes back, there's going to be a group of people that are going to cry for the rocks and the mountains to fall in on top of them to cover them up so that they don't have to face their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because of the sin in their lives, because they didn't take care of the most important thing, they didn't take care of their soul. And so now when Jesus comes back, they, they will be ashamed and not want to face him. But what a wonderful thing it would be if we have taken care of every sin in our life. We look forward to the coming again of Jesus Christ. I'll tell you the difference. And I've used this illustration before, but it's a, it's a good one. And that is my granny used to end almost every prayer that she prayed with, and Lord, come quickly. That used to scare me to death. <laughs> Because I was afraid that he would come quickly and I wasn't ready. She was ready. Her life was in order. Her sins had been taken care of. She was ready to meet the Lord. I, in my foolishness, had not straightened my life out to where it should be. And I didn't want to think about that final day. I didn't want to think about the fact that God was going to judge me according to his scripture, according to the, the life that Jesus lived and how closely my life looked to his. So I was ashamed and didn't want the Lord to know how bad I had become. God intends better for us. God wants to be able to see us in the pristine beauty of holiness. Do you realize that today we can be in absolute harmony with Christ himself? And all of the sins that we've committed and all of the, the, the bad things that we've done in our lives, that today we can turn those things around, we can ask for forgiveness, we can repent of those things and be pristine and beautiful and unashamed and have full confidence. The Bible tells us that we have an advocate with the Father who is Jesus Christ. And who is Jesus Christ to the Father? He is the son who lived a life that was pure and free from sin and died a death so that we would not have to. What a beautiful, beautiful thing Jesus has done for us so you and I would not have to. Lastly, sin cost Samson his life. Samson says, let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed himself with strength. And the house fell upon the lords and upon all of the people that were in it. So the dead were ki that he killed at his death were more than all that, that he had killed in his life. Again, Romans 6 verse 23 says, the wages of sin is death. Samson died because of the sin that he committed. He never should have been in Gaza. If he'd have stayed where God wanted him to be, the judge of all the people, if he'd have stayed at home, doing what he was supposed to do, he'd have never been in Gaza. You might want to underscore James chapter 1 and verse 15 in your Bible. Because it tells us that the end of sin is death. Lust brings about sin. It's, a, it's, it's what we, we see. We say we want that. We desire that. And, sin, and then lust brings forth that desire, that desire to, to have it. And then it turns to sin when we act upon it. And sin, when it's fully formed, when it's fully brought fruit, it brings forth death. Friends, we don't want sin in our lives. The end of sin is death. 
Revelation 21 and verse 8, he goes through and he lists all of those sins of adultery, idolatry, lying, stealing. And he says against all of those would be the second death. They would find themselves in the lake of fire, which is the second death. We don't want to be apart from God. Death is a separation from God. The thing that scares me about hell is that it's final. There's not going to be a second chance like we have right now. There's not going to be opportunity for grace to cover the multitude of sin. That will be over at judgment. And hell is eternal. Sin takes one farther than he ever wanted to go. It keeps you longer than you ever wanted to stay. And costs you more than you ever wanted to pay. The thing about hell is that it is permanent. In fact, the scripture says, God is an eternal God. The word there is Ionios. It means forever and ever without end. And guess what? Hell is Ionios, forever and ever without end. Can you imagine like that rich man in hell looking up with torment, wishing there was some way that he could have some relief and there was no relief? Just a drop of water to cool his tongue and there was no relief? No, you had your opportunity. Hell is eternal. Let's see sin as God sees sin. It's an affront to his righteousness, and we don't want any part of sin in our lives. When he comes, we want to make sure that our lives are washed in the blood of the Lamb, that our robes are white with, with uh, the righteousness that's found in Christ Jesus, not in our own righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ found in him. If you're here this morning and are wandering away from God, it's not too late right now. But we never know when our time is up. Jesus could come back at any moment. This week marked my mom's, the anniversary of my mom's death. And, uh, My mom died with an aneurysm to her brain. She was fine on her birthday, October the 19th, perfectly fine, celebrated her birthday. And then on the 20th, she had an aneurysm, died talking in the middle of a conversation on the telephone, just fell out dead. They kept her in the hospital, kept her on breathing machines and what have you for three or four days, but there was no bringing her back. It was instantaneous. I mean, you never know. But today we have an opportunity. Right now, the time is yours. While together we stand and sing.